As sports history fans, we often reminisce about the legends. Willis Reed limping on to the NBA Finals Court, Kurt Schilling's bloody sock, Kerry Strug's courageous dismount, and so many more. These moments often define sports history. But what about the countless injuries that did not become legends or careers that were derailed due to inadequate care? That's where this episode sponsor comes in. Introducing to you, ILP Sports Consultants, your trusted sports injury partner available 24-7. Brian Maelli at ILP Sports Consultants has over 20 years of experience in the orthopedic and sports medicine industry, and he has worked with athletes across the gamut, from youth to amateurs, professionals, in almost every sport played in the United States of America, accommodating athletes at every stage of their career. This adaptability ensures that ILP services are perfectly tailored to your skill level, no matter where you are in your athletic journey. With ILP, you are in control. Choose the steps that matter most to you. Diagnosis, treatment plan, recovery, or the whole journey. ILP services are tailored to your unique needs. Rushing for care is a common pitfall leading to future problems. ILP Sports Consultants helps you make the right decisions, ensuring that you receive timely and safe care. And here's a bonus. Brian hosts the Injured List podcast, sharing insights and athlete stories you won't want to miss. Whether you're a concerned parent or grandparent or an athlete yourself seeking guidance, ILP Sports Consultants is your beacon of hope in sports injury management. Visit ILPSports.com today. That's the letters ILP Sports.com. ILP Sports Consultants, where your well being is the priority and your recovery is the mission. Choose ILP Sports Consultants for a healthier sports journey, helping you get back in the game the smart way. Blog Talk Radio. Tonight, we'll go back in time to seasons past, when 22 men graced the rugged fields of yesterday, fighting for one more first down, one more yard gain, one final score, which would bring victory after 60 minutes of battle on the gridiron. Tonight, we'll explore the world of gridiron greats. Welcome to Gridiron Greats Football History and its Memorabilia on the Gridiron Greats Publishing and Broadcasting Network. In conjunction with Swift Enterprises, and we're live from the Wallingford, Connecticut home of Good Iron Greats Magazine. I'm Bob Swift, publisher and editor of Good Iron Greats Magazine, and I'll be your host for the show. Good Iron Greats is the only publication in America which focuses upon the history and memorabilia of the North American football game since its inception in 1869. We cover 150 plus years of football history and memorabilia. You can find us on the web at gridirongreatsmagazine.com. My co-host is a senior contributing writer to Gridiron Greats Magazine, a football memorabilia historian specializing in pre-World War II items, in particular Red Grange, and also Seattle Seahawk items, in particular Steve Larger. He hails from Portland, Oregon. Mr. Joe Squire. Joe! Welcome to the show tonight. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I love it. Good to be here, we Captain, here. as always. We're here live, and we're entering spring. <laughs> the days are getting longer. <clears throat> However, the football card and memorabilia market continues to astound 
anything that I've ever seen in my days of collecting. And we're going to talk a little bit a little bit about it before we get started with our guest tonight. And I'm going to lead off and then hand off to you. October 19, 1924, many, many years ago, the Green Bay Packers entertained the Milwaukee Badgers. And a stub, ticket stub from that game, and a program from that game, just sold an auction for a mere $21,000. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. And in a way, I am very, very happy to see that because it is a well-deserving price for a very, very rare ticket stub and a rare program. Thoughts on that, Joe? Well, as you and I were talking, yeah, you, you just summed it up. What what a price for a ticket stub. If you – what a price. I mean, and uh, uh, obviously vintage – Green Bay Packer memorabilia, one of the first, one of the earliest games uh, that their uh, ticket stub has been available, 1924, the very young Packers, uh, just incredible. I mean, that was something I was watching. It was something I was hoping that I could uh, pick up to give you for Christmas. Obviously, <laughs> the breadth of my, love, of my love for the captain stopped at about 19,000, so... <laughs> Well, I appreciate yeah. that, Joe. I can't just match it for you, though. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> just pretty cool when you think a... about it, though. Just vintage, vintage football, and this is vintage. Uh, the Green Bay Packers are steeped in NFL history, like we've talked about. And, and so this is a piece of NFL history to have one of the first ticket stubs known for Green Bay Packer game. It's pretty cool. And I think uh, there's enough Packer collectors out there and there's enough um, Packer collectors who actually understand the value of items that old and that rare. So that's a healthy price, a healthy and a deserving price for it. And uh, I don't know if it was in that same auction, but um, Heritage also had an ice bowl ticket that went for 7500 yeah. bucks. And um, yeah. I've seen the ice bowl tickets two to four thousand. Realistically, I would say now it should be a ten thousand dollar ticket for the simple reason wow. <clears throat> it is a very, very, although not as rare as something from nineteen twenty four. The historical significance of that game is is you know massive as far as I'm concerned, and to own a piece of history like that, even though there were a lot of tickets that did survive over the years. Uh, it's still a historical rare piece. Obviously, not as rare as that 1924 uh, Badger Packer stub and program. Something we've talked yeah. about on the on the show numerous times. If we talked about it once, any 1920s NFL program to me is mm-hmm. exceptionally rare, and is you know if you find it, you have one piece of history. You have a very rare piece of history, and it, there's great value to it. What the value is, the market is starting to now uh, dictate a much higher price than it was 20, 25, 30 years ago at the same time. Yeah, couldn't, agree. couldn't agree more. And the provenance of this piece, and it, it is a ticket stub with a program. The program is more of an insert. You know, it's a one-page or right. folded in half with, with advertising. But still, it is a program. The provenance... Well, the Heritage did an amazing job, you know, putting the provenance in there as well. Like I said, it's, uh, it's, you know, this was an uncle. Uncle was a huge Packers fan, lived in, you know, Green Bay, with, you know, when the Packers came around. This ticket stub and uh, and program had been put into a uh, a table under glass uh, for for who knows how long. Uh, they went to sell or refurbish the table. I forget what it was. Lifted the glass up and discovered it underneath. Um, and I'm glad they did, or a piece of history would have been lost. And uh, right, uh, yeah, we've we've also talked about you know paper drives. I mean, something you and I have never had to go through. Um, and so when we say paper drive, uh, you know, it, it's foreign to me. But I can only understand. I mean, you've got 
you know, the, you know, the American government saying we need you to recycle, we need you to use less. Right. Uh, you know, you know, we need paper, we need metal, we need everything. Uh, this is the war effort, and it's a unified America behind it. So, paper drive. You can just imagine these worthless ticket stubs, these worthless programs, and I'm using air quotes when I say worthless. Uh, you know, all of this getting, you know, and we and we all, all the kids march on down to the paper drive and they put all the paper in, and you're doing your civic duty. Uh, exactly. So these voracious paper drives, how much memorabilia was lost to this? So, uh, first of all, it, it's fascinating. I wonder how many people attended the game because this was, uh, you know, the the what, what was the Bellevue Stadium? It was the the. I mean, what was that? It was like eleven or twelve thousand capacity, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very small. It was, it was uh, the, um, and I can't I can't get a good grasp as far as where it was located. I wanted to say it was near the high school, but I could be completely wrong. I got to I got to research it again. But the attendance would be very very small, one way or the other, as compared to what we're used to today fifty sixty yeah. seventy thousand whatever it may be. You know what I mean? So, um, so you take as far over. as I'm concerned, yeah. As far yeah. as I'm so, concerned, yeah. it's uh, beyond rare. So, yeah. So you take ten. I call it eleven thousand people who attended the game. How many people throw the stub away because it's a ticket stub? I mean, how many people have the wherewithal to take the ticket stub home, realizing you know this could, this NFL thing might take off? Uh, you know, how many how many uh, you know, ticket stubs over time get lost to paper drives. How many fires? How many floods? How many how many right. moms right. Throw, throwing out kids' collections? This thing is coming up on a hundred years old, and it's a piece of paper the size of a credit card. Pretty easy to lose something like that, and we're just we're lucky to see it pop up and be up for auction. And as you mentioned, uh, the the uh, the industry has spoken, the hobby has spoken. This little piece of paper from 1924, steeped in Green Bay Packer history, is worth twenty one thousand dollars. That's pretty good, uh, and I, I mean, that's I, and I really, I really feel that it's been a market for older paper that has been undervalued and unappreciated for years. Uh, I mean, I can go to shows and see people basically giving away programs from the seventies, eighties, nineties just to get rid of them, type of thing. And I also see at the same shows stuff from the 50s and 60s, let's say, which to me is is exceptionally undervalued one way or the other, uh, especially for, you know, uh, games which many dealers won't bother researching what actually happened in the game, especially when it comes to a yeah. football game. And and uh, that that's kind of uh, an issue, for lack of a better term, in the hobby too, where somebody yeah. just picks up, you know, does a clean out, and they're trying to get rid of the stuff, and uh, yep. you know, just just dump it, and that's it. It's amazing. Or really they're amazing. Form. There's a there's a ticket stub on eBay right now, and it's Red Grange's New York Yankees versus the Pottsville Maroons in yep. 1927. Yep. And at first yep. glance, you're like, wow, that is amazing. But then if you dig down one layer, you realize. You know, this game is a game that happened about a month after Red Grange blew his knee out, and Red Grange right. didn't play in this game. Uh, right. so, oh, okay. So what is it worth? But uh, we on VFC, somebody mentioned the Packers premium that goes on. You know, you know Packers items like this, programs, etc. And I, I don't know where, and that's a good way to play it, the premium. But I don't know where. But something like ten years ago, I was reading an article, and it was just listed the top four teams in the NFL with the largest, you know, most voracious fan base. And it was the Mm -hmm. Green Bay Packers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Dallas Cowboys, and the -the fill-in-the-blank Raiders, Uh, Oakland, L.A., Las Vegas. now. And it was like these four teams have the greatest following of fans, period. Uh, So if if you want to go after, you know – you know, items of historical value to those four teams, you're not just bumping up against hobbyists, but you're also bumping up, you know, against rabid fan base. Uh, and then I would say on the fringe of that, now you have New York Patriots fans and probably New York Giants fans, just because, again, the Giants are steeped in NFL history, as are most of those teams I mentioned. Obviously, the, you know, the Cowboys are 
are, are newer, and the Raiders are newer, both AFL expansion teams. But, well, it's almost it's almost you got two extremes as far as the premium is concerned. I've always talked about this. You got the original NFL teams or the teams surfacing out of the 20s and 30s, and then you got the moment. expansion of AFL NFL 1960. So basically, what you got is a 60 year period to collect as compared to almost a hundred year. Uh, hundred year period to collect as with the Packers, you know what I mean. So it's it's really uh, for a collector starting out it could be very very overwhelming. Yet I point out, and I know I talked about this on the show years ago, back in the 1970s, it was very common for collectors, and there were probably I would say 50 to 60 of them who wanted to collect every program of the AFL. They, they were in pretty almost success, completely successful with it if they didn't bother with the preseason games because obviously pre, a lot of the preseason games were in uh, different locations and a lot of those programs are very difficult to come to come by and or they would do like a Vikings or a Cowboys uh, or a Falcons or a Saints collection and they would start collecting from game one and start picking up the programs that way. Try to do that with the Packers. It's literally impossible, uh, oh. you know. So I'm, not unless you got unlimited I'm, funds and, and a spatter yeah. all the time trying to find the stuff. So yeah, no doubt. I mean, I'm working on a Red Grange run of college ticket stubs. I'm halfway there, a little over halfway there, and I feel like I've accomplished something. I mean, uh, right. The other half of that hill that I'm worried about. I mean, I'll I'll talk to you in a decade, Captain. You know, when I you know when I'm 75 percent of the way there. These are very few and far between, 100-year-old tickets, 100-year-old right. programs uh, and stuff. So when they come up, it's like, oh, my gosh. I mean, just if I can land one or two a year, I'm in good shape. Uh, I mean, exactly. and that's asking a lot. It's, it's interesting. But, yeah, the Chicago Bears are another team, you know, that you just mentioned that should be. You'd think people would be more rabid fans, I mean, just with the populace of Chicago, but they're not. It's, uh, it's interesting. And, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Not, you know, it's also – it's also interesting, same with the with the uh, team premiums. Let's say, let's look at the Cowboys. I know a couple of people that just collect uh, sixty to sixty nine Cowboys stuff, or someone who just collects nineteen seventy to seventy nine stuff. You know what I mean? So uh, they specialize in it, and or they, you know, the few total collectors, as I call them, you know, trying to collect every pro day one. You know, it's a Herculean task, but it is much easier today than it was 20, 30 years ago before the Internet. And, uh, you know, you basically did a lot of writing and a lot of phone calls and a lot of a lot of show hunting to see what you can come up yeah. with. And, um, you know, again, it's uh, it's interesting to see. It's interesting to view. But I, I was pretty much blown away looking at the prices yeah. for those uh, – the ice bowl ticket and then and the Badger Packer ticket yeah. and and uh, program. And you were truly amazing. watching this, hoping, hoping hoping it would slip through the cracks and you'd be able to pick it up. But I mean, is this to you a collector, a a Packer premium? Like, is this a, a rabid Packer collector, like uh, like like you or the guests were about to you know to interview, or is this a fringe? You're seeing a lot of investors you know moving into the hobby, is it, or in your no, opinion, I. I to me, I've always seen a Packer premium. I mean, I go back, you know, I could look back to the 90s. There was still a Packer premium, especially for the Lombardi years. And uh, yeah, back then, I, I I toyed around with the idea of just trying to put together every Lombardi program and ticket stub. And, um, you know, it's tough. It is not It is not easy. Then if I picked up something, I got a I got another collector calling me, hounding me for the piece, you know, willing to pay me double, triple at the time for what I paid for it. Mm. And, you know, I had to make decisions one way or the other. So, you know, I did sell some of them off. And I just said, this is, to me, it's not going to be possible. It, it, you know, and I'd rather see, you know, my own collection as far as Packer stubs and programs is intense. In no way, shape, or form does it compare to a lot of other collectors that I know who are, you know, to do have those types of complete runs, so on and so forth. And uh, I always thought when uh, Fargo's playing, put together a run of his stuff as a Packer, and even that became difficult. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, and it's, it's fun trying to collect it and, and hunt it down. But I do believe yeah. the Packer premium 
is a legitimate premium that <laughs> Packer collectors are willing to put on pieces in order to yep. uh, get the items for their collection. Yep, that's confirmed. That's what it I mean, you just, you just mentioned you you just mentioned you've been seeing it since you've been a collector, and that you know that jives with that article that I mentioned. Where I mean, somebody yeah yep. that makes sense. I mean, those are the most popular teams. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, as an old you know as a lifelong Seahawks fan, and you know Seattle Seahawks used to be in the old AFC West division with the Oakland Raiders, and I remember uh, the Raiders Raider fans would outnumber the Seahawks fans when they when uh, when the games were played at the old yep. Kingdom. So yeah. They travel. I believe it. I believe well, it. Oh, all right. And again, we're Packers fans would outnumber Seahawks fans when the Packers came to town. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But. <laughs> Very true. Very true. All right, our guest is here, and I'd like to introduce him and get him on the show. Our special guest tonight was born and raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin, in 1971. He started collecting both baseball and football cards around 1983 and sold the majority of his baseball cards to pay for his college. But Good he got man. his football cards. In 1998, when Good he man. found eBay, he got the urge to collect. He is now 95% focused on Green Bay Packer collecting, and in particular, his passion of the Team Packer Hall of Fame set on PSA. He also enjoys helping other collectors find tough-to-find items and also upgrading their sets. I'd like to welcome to our show this evening, Mr. Troy Jellick. Troy, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it to be here. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Right to follow up on your uh, Bellevue Stadium, Bellevue Park. Uh, it's about a quarter mile from Green Bay East where uh, City Stadium was. And uh, so oh, all right. okay. you, you you pretty much had it nailed down there, Captain. Oh, all right. I should have had the, what the do you I know should have had the right street, but I I ah. I drew a blank when I was looking at it because I and I and again I, I kind of figured it was right, right right around there, so that was good. Good. Did you know that from memory, uh, Troy? Or did you look that up while you're on hold? Uh no, that one I knew where that was because I re- I went to Green Bay Preble, which was the school uh, the other school on the east side of Green Bay. So Green Bay East was a huge rival, and uh, I knew I was running on the same, you know, track and uh, football field that uh, Don Hudson played on and many of the wow. other Packers. And so I wow. drilled back into all that history when I lived up there. It was pretty sweet. Right now, actually, if you go to the McDonald's on Main Street, that's where Bellevue Park was. Now, wow. where, where was that in, in relationship to where Lambeau is now? Uh, well, Lambeau's in Ashwabana. So this is, you're probably talking a good five, six miles southwest of uh, where Bellevue Park was, across the river. Okay. Uh, on the other side of Green Bay. Okay. So it's more near the bridge part over there? I'm trying to picture it in my mind. Because one time we went I, to Green Bay, we stayed, we stayed downtown yeah, Green Bay at a B&B. Right. It's so. not considered downtown. It's, it's the east side of Green Bay. For east sure. side, okay. East of the East River. Right. Yeah, east of the East River. Okay, all right. I got an idea of where it is. The the several times yeah. we've been there, we 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 try to explore Green Bay. We explored Door County, which I love, and uh, we were in um, where the Lombardi Steakhouse was. Is it, that's an Appleton, mm-hmm. I think? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, that that was a who we had reservations, and uh, we ended up eating with the uh, Falcons coaching staff. We're two tables over from us. So Brenda and I were in our Packer regalia, and there's the Falcons <laughs> coaching staff over there. And they were cool about it, so it was funny. Outstanding. All right. Troy, I got to lead off. I got to ask you, how did you start collecting football cards? So any uh, young kid in uh, Wisconsin, we all were in bowling leagues. So in between bowling games, uh, I would go to the card show that was in the back of the bo- uh, at the bowling alley, and I picked up packs. So that was 1982, and uh, wow. it was it, it was just kind of funny, you know. You you go back uh, and you get yelled at by the league runner, saying you can't go to the card show. You got to bowl. You got more leagues. So we got, got all the kids got yelled at. So it was kind of kind of neat. But at that same run. Um, I did collect, I started collecting in 82 because the Packers were doing well. 
Bart Starr had him coming back. Uh, Lynn Dickey was actually having an offense, and they picked up uh, John Jefferson. So I got Uh huge in the football then. And then my mom jumped in by uh, going into the, I can't remember if it was JCPenney or Sears catalog, and she bought me the full uh, collated set, uh, football and baseball, from about 82 to maybe 87, 88. So my mom really pushed me into it more than my dad, which was kind of rare. Good on Wow. Yeah, it was a good start. You got a late start, it was then, Troy. Uh, yeah, because I, uh, I mean, you were, we're about the same age. I was born in the late 1970s, and uh, I got into collecting around, you know, eight. So, you, yeah, you got a late start there if you're, you're in 82, 83. Right, yeah, you know, I was 11, 12 years old, and we would get packs uh, for Halloween throughout the subdivision. And um, one oh. thing I guess I, I – yeah, so that kind of got me in there. I, I had the Larry Bird rookie uh, that I cracked in the three with Magic Johnson and Julius Irving. <laughs> you, know, the, 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 you know, all those memories that just want to make you vomit. But uh, <laughs> one thing that, that really I, that I, I guess I failed to write down in my notes here is the um, Packer police cards started in 1983. Yeah. And that yeah, got a yeah. ton of kids involved, and me included. So I would add that into uh, my uh, push to collect. 83, I thought, uh, like, the Seahawk police cards started around 79, I think. Captain, you'd probably know that better than I do. But, Seahawks were uh, 79. The Pack- Packers started, uh, was 83. That was their first year. Oh. However, the Packers, the Packers have the longest-running police set, and ah. I don't know. you got to confirm for me, Troy, and I – did they put a set out this past season? I don't know because I don't have a. I stopped at nineteen. I I, I stopped um, actually at eighty nine because I only just wanted the ones I actually got from the cops myself. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got to take on that stopped because eighty nine as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, Seahawks Seahawks the reason. Oh, yeah, sorry, the reason I think uh, the Packers started police cards in eighty three is there's significantly less crime here compared to Seattle. That's got to be it, right? <laughs> Oh, well, Troy, strikes, Troy, Troy, Troy strikes first. I like it. Good man. <laughs> the, the other thing with the Seahawks, too, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Aura, we started issuing um, some sort of series of cards. I don't know how they were sold. Yeah. They were in the brick uh, packages yep. or whatever. And yep. um, I know plastic, I got a, I, plastic baggies in, in the in the bread, yeah. Okay. I still have a hard time so seeing an Aura Week card not smelling the bread. Yeah. Uh, but well, awesome, Troy. You've always been so good in the hobby, man. I've always just admired your passion. Just and as Bob said in your introduction, just how willing you are to just share with other hobbyists and help people along. I love the videos you put together. You're just you're, just, you're really passionate about your Packers, and I just I admire it. So I, I tip my hat. And um, you know, it said you you were you know were you were you know you collected that one sport, the little white ball they throw out somebody with a stick. And football, and I'm just I'm glad you ended up. I'm glad you ended up with football. It's just it's way more manly. It's way more accepted in uh, in the hobbyist circles. So yeah, you know it worked out well. Going well, back, yeah. So going back to that Packer Hall of Fame, tell us about it because you know the Packers are like we said, just steeped in history, and so the Packers Hall of Fame set has is, is, has got to be just one of the most admired sets. It, it, it is, and it's actually the, there's two uh, Packer sets out there. There's a Packer Hall of Fame set for those in the mm-hmm. Hall of Fame in Canton, and then I started the Team Hall of Fame set with uh, another collector, Jay Radke, another um, Packer meathead like myself, and we lamented over this for a couple of years. We were both doing the Pro Football Hall of Fame set and trying yep. to follow their guidelines, and I um, talked to a couple of their uh, the big guys on that line, um, one of them being Jasp, um, we're all aware of who that is on the uh, Hall of Fame line. He wasn't too yep. keen on me starting there. He's like, it's not going to work. No one's going to collect that. If, forget about it. Just stick with what you got here. That's, um, and that's odd to hear that kind of negativity out of Jason. Huh. Yeah, no kidding, <laughs> Mr. Peebles. But uh, <laughs> we uh, we ended up pushing forward, and but we started our set differently than any of the other sets on PSA. So when PSA has the uh, all-time rushing set, it's the rookie card of each player. 
or you yeah. know the the MVP. It's always the rookie card. So you could have Roger, uh, someone who uh, far won two MVPs. He'd have the same card and set twice. So what we ended up doing is we wanted to have um, a minimum if they're serial numbered for newer cards under uh, more than twelve fifty. I'm sorry, more than nine ninety nine. My bad. Um, if we couldn't uh, get lined on there, we wanted a card that was used by the uh, the Hall of Fame football set. So, for instance, like Don Hudson, he doesn't have a playing year card, so we use the 1955 Topps All-American. And then if we go to the next step down, we wanted the first mainstream card issued in a Packer uniform or a college uniform. So, for instance, that would be like Bobby Dillon from 1952. He's got his Texas jersey on. My oh. favorite rule... Uh, we call it the Jim Taylor rule. It's the first mainstream card yeah. in a hacker uniform. It, we don't have the 59 or 60 Jim Taylor in our set. We have the 61 tops because it's Jim Taylor um, from the Packers, not the Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that, that, was, that was the kicker rule for us, and that's the one that PSA really pushed back for a while until we said, all right, we'll run the set and we'll run the votes. And though they took over the votes now, but uh, we were able to – convince them that it will be a collected set and it worked out very very well there's a couple many, of other little are, intricacies here go go ahead bob well how many people are actually collecting i'm curious i, I would assume 20, be, there should be i thought it was 28 um oh, okay i'm pulling up right now i've got there are 16 people at 40 percent or more and there's more, but they're, 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 you know, 10% people who just put it yeah, up to get a yeah. set to get their little vanity points on PSA. So the other stuff we had trouble with is um, players who, uh, individuals who didn't play for the Packers, like Red Cochran, our, our historian. So we've got his mm-hmm. 1950 Bowman in there. Um, oddball cards who never had a, a playing card. Um, the Lake the Lakes, the Cons Wieners. The drenched potato chips, chips. So for uh, Gremlinger, um, Fleming, those type of guys, you got those funky cards in there, and that, or even just memorabilia. It's a cool thing to have in the set, to not just have cards. And lastly, the it was disappointing, but we had to include the uh, '74 and '75 Fleer Immortal set because Johnny Blood and Herber Lambo and those guys didn't have real cards. But those are I dig, I dig them. Came yeah. to collect. They're great looking cards, but they're just hard to find in any condition because they're a little bit bigger. And uh, what also with this is we don't allow uh, jersey cards or autograph cards, just like they do in most of the major sets. Just because it just it adds difficulty to getting a card. We want to have the capability for people to complete the set. The hardest card to get in the set is by far the 1963 Cons Wiener of uh, Kotzelink. I mean, it's it's impossible. Oh. I have a raw one here, but uh, I haven't sent it off yet. And now I don't know if I'm going to because they just doubled their fees on us. Yeah, so, I heard about that. Yeah. Take, take, take nine months yeah. to get it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when I started the set back in 07, um, it was Jay and myself. I had the top set for about two years, and then I think um, – there were a couple other people who just filtered in and filtered out. But when Ryan and Scott, both on uh, Vintage Card uh, with us here, they jumped in and they took the set to an absolutely new level. Um, Ryan's set is absolutely crazy. He's got a rating of 9.6. His average uh, GPA is 8.99. And we're talking insane wow. cards. The, yeah, the star rookie, you got Horning in there, you've got Woodson, you got Hinkle. Um, and then um, Scott's right behind him at 8.7. And the cool thing is the two, the three of us have become very good friends. Um, we're, we all live within about 120 miles of each other. And, oh, um, nice. yeah, we've exchanged cards left and right. When, I've had a couple of cards that neither of them could find in 10. I secret Santa uh, one to uh, Scott Klein one year and just shipped another one up over to Ryan. And we help each other back out. I mean, it's a really cool set. Not just the set itself, but the people. Everyone helps you. It's paying it forward. I'd sell my 10 to uh, Ryan. He'd give me his 9, and then I'd find an 8, and I'd just pass it down to the guys who are collecting lower sets. 
and we give each other pretty good deals. It's a fun, fun group. That's the way it should be. Good for you guys, man. I like that. That's neat. That is, that is. That's good to hear. Yeah. Good to hear. This that not a cutthroat thing. You're, you're doing it from uh, the fun part of collecting plus the historical value, the way you're, you're choosing the cards. So that's, that, that, that's really, that's really good. I, I didn't really yep. understand it until you were explaining it. And, uh, wow. That's great. Yeah. There was a lot was of thought. Really we spent two years. Yeah. Figuring out what to do. And what I really like is it's just like a pro football set. There's new cards added every year. So uh, we've got Charles Woodson coming in. So that'll be his 2006 tops Chrome. Um, instead of his uh, 99 FP and the Raiders. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a fun set, and it always gets bigger. You know, it's interesting. I always said to myself, if I ever split up my collection, I would just keep all my Packers cards and then, then try to sell off the rest of them and keep a few of the uh, 60s stuff that I, you know, I grew up with type of thing. But uh, I'm glad to see you guys are taking it from the actual Packer perspective and the Packer uniform. I think that's really important uh, than, you know, like a Woodson, you know, what, what's the point of putting him as, as a Raider? You know, he was a Packer too. When you're doing a Packer yep. Hall of Fame thing, you know, doesn't make sense. Hey, can you, uh, Troy, can you, can you talk about your, uh, put you on the spot? What are the top six items in your collection? So that, that, wow, that, that was a tough one. So I came up with one through five pretty easy. Six was kind of tough. But uh, Joe knows my sense of humor. Actually, pretty much everyone on the board knows my sense of humor. <laughs> so my younger brother is an absolute nut for William Henderson. Uh, I was at a car show here in Milwaukee. Um, I live now in the Milwaukee area, no longer in Green Bay. And Henderson was there uh, signing autographs. And I was unaware he was there, but he gave away one of his eight by tens. So he's like, well, what would you like me to write on it? And like, just out of bloom, like to Jeff, your brother is the greatest William Henderson. <laughs> so he signs it with that. And I, I send it to my brother and he calls me on the phone, just dying. <laughs> so, so to throw it to another level, uh, three years ago, I was up at Charles Woodson's uh, golf outing, and a close friend of mine uh, chaired that event and uh, introduced me directly to Charles and shook his hand, talked to him. I said, hey, can you sign this and sign it to Jeff? Your brother is still the greatest. Oh, my God. <laughs> I got that to him, too. So fun, That's fun funny. stuff. Um. That would be, those would be my number. I still have the Woodson one here. He has the Henderson one at his house. My other, I go for number five. Um, I roomed with Ken Bowman's son in college. Uh, so got to meet Ken and talk some great stories. Um, and uh, actually used Ken to have, when my daughter was in third grade, she wanted to do an article on Vince Lombardi. And she called Ken down in Arizona. And uh, they talked for like 45 minutes and, she had one heck of an article, but I was at the national one year and they had a ton of Packers there that year. And Bowman was one. And uh, I dropped the little mini helmet to him and he just kind of kept his head down. He's like, how would you like the inscription? I could do it to a two Troy, Terry's favorite roommate from college. And he's halfway right. And he looks up and he's just completely bewildered. He's like, Holy cow, Troy comes out, gives me a big hug. And uh, that's one of my uh, cool little helmets I've got right in the center of uh, my right collection on. in my Packer room. Wow. wow. <laughs> yep. That's so cool. then another one, um, <laughs> unless you guys want to ask questions on that one, I can jump no, down to the I, next I one. Think, I think growing up in Green Bay really gives you that, uh, you know, there's so many people who are Green Bay fans just because they're so, they're, you know, they're so steeped in history. But I, I think growing up in Green Bay really gives you that, what swagger that legitimacy i guess is the best way you know yeah it, i mean yeah ah, i, I you, love hearing you've it. Had, yeah. yep you've uh you you see packer players everywhere i remember uh the vaccinator terrell buckley was signing autographs at the Sherway. he would beg your groceries and then sign an autograph for you and all the oh. fun little things um if uh well Captain, you remember Randy Wright, the old uh, quarterback from Wisconsin that played for the Packers a few years? Yeah. 
he yep. at the yep. same time he played, he coached uh, touch football in the Catholic League for uh, grade schoolers. And I played against Randy Wright. Like it's four o'clock after practice, and we're playing a game, and he's out there coaching a Packer player. It's crazy. Some of the fun fun wow. stories that are out there from these old Packers. So yeah. let me think. Another cool item I've got. That's um, community. That's I have the original. Yeah, that is good community. I have the original, uh, one of the original renderings of the current Lambeau Field. So when they were making all of the drawings and what they were um, sending up for proposal, uh, I have the colored, uh, I think it's called a Dodge Report, cover yep. of the blueprint. And uh, it has a completely, I don't want to say a completely different look, but it's got tons of trees in the parking lot. The Lambeau and Lombardi statues are much closer to the parking lot, not uh, near the uh, entrance. And the clock doesn't exist, which to me is crazy that they don't have the Lombardi. Uh, the Lombardi you're, if you're 15 minutes, uh, if you're not there 15 minutes early, you're late clock. And that wasn't on the rendering. So I have that framed up in my, uh, right above my fireplace upstairs. I have a wife that loves sports. So I am one of the luckiest men around. I have memorabilia all over the house, and wow. she loves it. It's crazy. So lucky man here. That's good um, to hear. Oh, I, yeah, there there aren't many ladies out there like that. So <laughs> I did marry up. I gotta gotta give her a little props here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, yep. yeah. I talked I talked my wife into being a Seahawks fan. So she, she's still there, but. Right on. What else you got? Sorry, but sorry to hear that, Joe, <laughs> that you had to talk her into that. Um, wow. So my fa- <laughs> Boy, I'm, not, I'm not used to being on the ropes here, Troy. Right. <laughs> uh, being up in Green Bay, my father would golf at the Lombardi Cancer Outing, um, and he'd always come home with autographs for me. And he calls me uh, from uh, before the outing, and he always tells me who he's partnered up with. He's like, yeah, I got some hippie rookie. And I'm like, Really? Like, yeah, he comes home. He's like, I don't know. I think he's the quarterback. So I have an Aaron Rodgers autographed golf ball from his rookie oh. season. Wow. Which I absolutely love. It is, I've never seen an autographed golf ball by Aaron Rodgers. And, uh, I mean, you know, the provenance of having my dad there with the, uh, his little stub from that he hangs on his golf bag and everything. It's a real neat little setup I've got. Oh, my gosh. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yep. Yeah, that's a neat little item. Wow. And then, uh, Joe, you were involved with this one, the group buy huh. for the Walker's Cleaners. I love my Johnny Blood McNally and Arnie Herbert. Oh, um, and, that's so cool that that makes it time. I love it. Good for you, man. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's number two. The Johnny Blood has been on the top of my list for oh. years because it was made during his playing years. I mean, besides that matchup Absolutely. where he's on the Steelers, yeah. I mean, that's why I wanted this card. And same thing with Herbert. Um, it, it just, it made my day. Well, first off, when I saw it on eBay, I nearly, I think I'm like, I can't afford that. I don't want, I want, I don't want the whole set. Like, and then we talked with Jeff Kane and he sets up this group by in what, five, six days. And boom, we've all, uh, we split the setup between eight, nine, ten guys. And it was yep. an amazing uh, collection. I got yeah, to get my line. Well, Got to tip my hat to old insane Jeff Payne for putting that together. No, no doubt. Uh, without him, I would I would not have been able to put that through. And the heart, I mean, that was That's... June of COVID. And I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, broke. No. Yep. yeah. And I'm like, I sold I sold just stuff just to make the money to get that one covered. So right. that was a good one. Right. That makes that makes my day that that was cool because that was a really cool group effort, man. I really like that. Yeah, that was. I was highly impressed with the group, how fast we put it together, the trust we put into everybody, and uh, totally. it worked out. There's, yeah, there's there a great go. deal of camaraderie there, and that's that's good. Yep, that's great to hear. So my favorite item uh, in my collection, it's not worth the most, but it has the absolute coolest story behind it. Um, yep. it the Packers give away, oh, well, not give away, but they have hand-signed Wilson footballs throughout the 70s and 80s. And I have a team ball from 19 – I'm thinking it's 83. I still have three players to figure out if it's 83 or 84. But 
the ball is, uh, is absolute perfect shape. I traded a guy, um, a Will Clark collector, and I was a Will Clark nut in my days, and I had one card he needed, and he, is, he has the number one set on PSA for years, and he's like, I'll trade you some Packer stuff. I'm like, I don't care. I don't collect baseball. I shipped it off to him. He sends me this in the uh, this ball in the uh, in the original mm. Wilson box. Uh, it's got wow. the the uh, the stapled business card of the individual from Claremont Transfers in Milwaukee uh, stapled to it. And it's like, yeah, my dad got this from his sales rep. He goes, look inside and read the business card. So I pull out the business card. Lo and behold, it's Ray Nitschke. Ray Nitschke <laughs> gave this guy the ball. I have Ray Nitschke's business card with this ball. It is just a great fun story to tell. Wow. <laughs> what did Ray so Nitschke cool. do for a business after he retired? This was a transportation company. He was based out of the Escanaba, oh. Michigan location. So, you know, three hours north of Green Bay uh, for a drive. So that's what I read on the card here, but it doesn't have a title for Nitschke. But I, I, I love it. That's all you need. The, the, that's yeah, all you need. The ball Nitschke. is in great shape. That's that sells. Yes. <laughs> yep, exactly. Right out. Well, that's awesome. And those are well, my fun items. You've got such a breadth of, of collection. You just ran through golf balls, and I, I love it, man. I like this. What, what, what's your white whale? I mean, what, what, what? What's on your what's on your uh, must have list? So I've been searching for a 1935 Wheaties Don Hudson with the border intact at a reasonable price for some time. There was Maybe one available about. I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. Can you say that again? 1935 uh, what? Uh, the premium? 1935 Wheaties, the cereal, Wheaties. the cereal oh, box, yeah. the All Americans. Yeah, yeah, and oh, I yeah. Want yeah, the Hudson card, again, the only real collectible during his playing years. And mm-hmm. I want that. And there was one available that I, it, it was perfect. And I fell asleep and didn't get the bid on it. It oh. was so depressing. And it didn't go for a huge, it was like 600, 700. But the ones that look great right now, the buy it now is for 1500. And they, they won't even remotely go near an offer, uh, you know, south of, uh, tw- I'm sorry, north of 12. So I've just got to find it at the right price. Mm. The other one I'm working yeah. on that I want is I want to get a note card uh, or white paper signed by Curly Lambeau. I'm working on a the Goal Line Art set, and I've got most of the guys signed on the cards that were alive when they were made. And then I need to put a Lambeau and a Johnny Blood. I'm going to get them encapsulated through PSA and then have that whole set autographed. Wow. So that'll be a fun looking one. And wow. this one will throw you guys for a loop. Um, I wanted either a signed goal line art or an autographed Walter Payton jersey. So as a Packer fan, that. yep, uh, just, I hated watching playing him because he just rolled over us, wow. but respected the snot of him. He's the, he's my Larry Bird of football. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. a reason they call them sweetness. Yep, exactly. So one thing I've always truly wanted, I'm leaning more toward the goal line arts because I've got the um, the other Packer set with it. So we'll see what comes up. Well, cool. Nice to be able to whittle that uh, want list out after you received a you know Steve Largent Christmas ornament. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's still on the tree. I didn't take it down after I sent the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, right. that do, you have any, do you have any memories you'd like to share with our audience about uh, any games you saw over the years at Lambeau? So I, I, I'm a very spoiled Packer fan. Uh, when yeah. I told you I had that rendering from uh, Lambeau, my, the company yeah. my father was a controller for did many, uh, much of the upgrades. <laughs> and they weren't the GC, but they were a preferred contractor. So spoiled, went to many games. Uh, The fun story I like to tell is the owner of my dad's company, Pat Martin, he went to college with Paul Horning at Notre Dame. And when Paul was stationed in uh, Fort Riley in Kansas, Pat is the guy that flew his plane, picked Horning's uh, tail up, 
brought him back to Green Bay so he could play the game and flew him back. Wow. So really cool story. Yeah. So I got a feeling they got some preferential treatment uh, throughout the years to get a plenty of tickets. <laughs> so what that got me, I mean, I have Favre's first, and I, kept, I, I have kept every ticket sub I've been to. And I was grinning ear to ear when you guys were talking about the ticket subs earlier with the Packer Badger game there. And um, I've got Favre's first start against the Bengals. Um, that's oh. probably my most expensive ticket that I've been to. Um, I was at the uh, 94 playoff game against the Lions when we held Barry Sanders to negative one yard. That was, uh, <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, that was a great one to see. Um, I went through the entire playoff run with my dad, um, and all these games are with my dad. So I sit with my dad at the game seats one and two, row, uh, section 12, row 57. And it, it, I know exactly where I sit. I could point in the picture, and uh, it, it was always fun. We did the whole playoff run together. Um, in 97, including the, uh, the NFC Championship game against Carolina when it was 16 below with the wind chill. Mm-hmm. I was at the Raider game in 93 when it was 20 below. Um, but the one game that I always remember uh, was a loss. Uh, Packers versus Atlanta. Michael Vick ran all over us in the playoffs in 02. Um, I was recently diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I was uh, my hair was just starting to fall out. And Longwell uh, shanked the field goal in the first. We're at the end of the third, and we are just getting our tail kicked. And I, I, I scream out, I'm like, you know, if Longwell misses this, I'm ripping my hair out. Sure as hell, he missed the field goal. I take off my winter gloves, and I just pull gobs of hair out of my head. This guy next to me oh, wow. in complete horror. He looks at me. He's like, looks to the left. He's like, get this guy a beer. So I got a free beer out of that. So, but uh, all healthy and no uh, issues of anything after that. But that ticket good. sub always meant good, something good. to me personally. Wow. wow. So, but well, overall, I counted my subs before this, and I have 107. Wow. Those are games so, you've been to. And that's yes, just sir. Lambeau or all over the NFL? Uh, no, that, uh, it includes um, four or five tickets for County Stadium and then nine away games. Uh, we would go to an away Packer game uh, we did for nine straight years. Well, but even this Seahawks yeah. fan knows that Lambeau is Mecca for football. And it is on my bucket list to make it to Lambeau. To, to see a Seahawk, you know, Packer game. It just so it is. You, you have I, you, you're not a football fan unless you've been to, to, to Mecca. So I know now I got another arm I could try to twist if I need tickets if they let people in again <laughs> in the future. Nice. I'll call up my buddy Troy wow. and say, "Can you help yep, me out?" I am a contact for sure. <laughs> Well, Troy, you, I mean, you're just you're you're a walking storybook. I mean, man, I'm just I'm grinning ear to ear hearing some of these stories, and so happy to be a part of some of them. You know, like you're you know you're talking about the you know Walker Packer cleaner set. So, but you have any other interesting stories you want to share with us? I mean, honestly, this is the the one when we talked about the Walker cleaner thing. That was just a great uh, setup. We talked about that just a little bit ago, and it's more of the community of how that works. And I mentioned, you know, the trust and how people help each other out. It's not the contest. I know PSA is out there to get, you know, the highest graded set and all this, but we all help each other out. Um, We had an individual we we raised money for, um, you know, to help out for a scholarship. I love that part of the hobby. And that's uh, kind of the way I've always been. I had a very close friend of mine sell his, uh, almost full PSA nine graded uh, 72 set and his all time Packer set uh, was third overall LU champions. If you look them up and I sold as much as I could for him at no cost. And then he shipped the rest to a co- co-signer. He's like, Troy, they're charging me 30%. I said, that's why I sold what I could for you. And it's just, you know, you scratch someone else's back, your, your back will get scratched eventually. That's great. That's great. I appreciate hearing that being in the hobby as long as I have, because I think sometimes I I don't hear that from some guys, and uh, you know you 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 know where it's at. So that, that's that's nice to hear. As I do with every guest, 
I ask any advice for beginning collectors. What's your take on that, Troy? So I guess, you know, I, I look at it two ways. Uh, are you a beginning collector going to collect vintage or are you a beginning collector coming into the card community? I answered that two different ways. If you are coming into the vintage side of it, I like to make it personal. Have a story behind your collection. You've seen that with uh, what I've uh, kind of mm-hmm. talked about today. And have cool things to talk about and be proud of your collection to show it off. Yeah. Um, if you're coming in and doing the new stuff, collect what you want. Don't follow the hype when you want to drive and collect some unwanted item. I mean, like who wants to collect Tim Tebow and uh, those type of things when he was hot and that type of thing. I collect what I want to collect. I'm not out there so much for the money. I'm out there for the hobby. That's well, if you, proof is in the pudding, you, you know, you, proof is in the pudding. I mean, just from what you just said, you're, you're putting together a Packers, you know, Hall of Fame set based on the cards you guys want to collect. Not the, not the Jim Taylor, you know, you know, like, you know, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. because they say that's the rookie card. So, yeah, good man. And so, before well, we, we go, oh. Oh. before we go, we've got about go four minutes. Joe, I'm handing off to you. You know what it is. Indeed. Well, Troy, if you've listened to the show, you know that uh, for some special guests, I have a very special segment called The Joe Quiz. So if you, uh, if you would entertain me, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and it's a A or B answer, and you just have to follow your heart. So quickly, Matt Hasselbeck, Hall of Fame Seahawk quarterback, professional clipboard holder for the Packers. Uh, Hall of Fame <laughs> Seahawk quarterback. That is correct. Nice job. All right. Amon Green, Seahawk great or Green Bay Packer hand me down? <laughs> Best trade in Packer history. Uh, I guess Packer hand me down. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is a really good trade, wasn't it? Shoot. Yes, it was. I remember Amon Green tearing it up at the Pro Bowl. I'm like, yeah. And then a year later, he was gone. I'm like, what happened there, guys? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> better better fans, cheese heads or twelfth man? Well, cheese is always better in Wisconsin. Uh, but if you're asking the question, cheese heads. The answer we turn this over. That is not correct. It's twelfth man. That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and you can you can answer with your heart or you can answer to get the or you can answer to get a hundred percent. You just you have to decide. All right. Last question. Don Hudson with 99 touchdowns in his career or Steve Largent, who broke Don Hudson's record with 100 touchdowns? I would go with Don Hudson because he technically had 105 touchdowns if you count his uh, interception returns and a rushing. Let me look at the answer. You are correct. Don Hudson is the better receiver. I'm a Seahawk fan, but even I know Don Hudson's the better receiver. Nice job. You did well. Three out of four. If only you'd gone with 12th man. Well done. I had another one. Try rock. But I think I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> I don't want to upset the captain. Sure. I thank you for being on. Any final comments? We're going to wrap things up here. We're almost out of time. I appreciate you guys having me. Love the hobby. Love having you guys involved with it, too. Thank you. You're a great guest, and I, I truly appreciate and enjoy listening to uh, anything about Packers, especially the history and uh, what you guys got with that Hall of Fame set is, is uh, very special, and uh, it's great for the hobby. Troy, thanks for being on. Joe, we have got to go into our two-minute warning and wrap-up. Very quickly, I'm handing off to you what you pick up on tonight's show. Uh, I really enjoy having classy guests like that on. I've known Troy, we've you know, both been in the hobby for a while, from the old PSA CU boards to, uh, you know, to, uh, to VFC. It's, uh, it's just fun. I, I, I didn't realize he was that, you know, just the little, the middle, little micro collections that he, ha- you know, that he has going on with just uh, the Packer Hall of Fame. Just love to hear about them, you know, trading stuff back and forth. That's the way the hobby should be. On the school bus, opening your lunch pail, 
grabbing your car- football cards with a rubber band around them and trading. I like it. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, Rob, we're almost out of time. GridironGreatsMagazine.com. If you're not a subscriber to Gridiron Greats Magazine, Joe. What are you waiting for? Seriously. And our spring issue, we're starting to work on it. It's going to be out uh, roughly the middle of April. Some great uh, great articles coming up in that issue. All right, 30 seconds, Joe. Final thoughts. I have an article I'm working on you. Uh, I will throw a teaser out there. It is on the 1976 Seahawks Fred Myers set, a set that is near and dear to pretty much everyone's heart, I would imagine. (laughs) That's a very interesting set. I've seen only a handful of those over the years at shows, and uh, they're very rare. All right, we're out of time again. Check out our website, gridirongreatsmagazine.com. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Back issues are also available for sale. We hopefully are going to be back next week. We've got another uh, couple guests we're working on. And until that time, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.